John chapter 12, continued. Jesus comes to Greeks. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast, the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus, John 12 20-22. Apparently Jesus has gone into the temple. Since there is a court for the women, and a court for the Gentiles, these Greeks cannot go in where Jesus is. Philip has a Greek name and may have spoken Greek, which is probably the reason they came to him. Philip is a modest and retiring fellow, and he goes to Andrew for help. Together they bring the Greeks to Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit, John 12 23-24. When our Lord says verily, He is about to say something very important to hear. And when He says, Verily, verily, it is of supreme importance. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal, John 12 25. Jesus answered them, I think, them, includes both the disciples and the Greeks. It seems that Jesus went out to speak to them. I do not believe he would refuse to come to anyone who was asking for him. The Greeks want to see Jesus, because they had heard about him, probably about his miracles, and especially his raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now he directs the attention of the Greeks to his cross. He is in the shadow of the cross. He tells them, the hour is come. What hour? The hour of crisis for which he came out of eternity, and toward which his entire life has moved. You remember, that he had said to his mother early in his ministry, mine hour is not yet come, John 2 4. Now his hour is come. He is going to the cross. His conception of the cross was far different from that held by the Roman populace. To them, it was an instrument of infamy, and disgrace and shame. It was the hangman's noose, the electric chair, and the gas chamber. He became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Why? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, Galatians 3:13. Then on the third day he was raised from the dead, and crowned with glory and honor. For the joy that was set before him, he, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12 2. The glory of God is seen in that cross. That is why he could say, that the time had come for him to be glorified. Friend, he was glorified when he died for you and me. He was glorified when he came forth from that tomb. Mercy and pardon and forgiveness are found at that cross. Then our Lord states a great principle using the physical analogy of a grain of wheat. Although a grain of wheat in the ground dies, it produces the blade, the ear, and the harvest. It must die to bring forth fruit. Many people think they have seen Jesus because they have read the Gospels and they have studied His life. They see the historical Jesus, but they have never seen Jesus until they comprehend His death and His resurrection. He died a redemptive death. He gave His life in death so that we might have life. You haven't seen Jesus until you have seen that He is the One, who died for you on the cross. He is the One who died, for the sins of the world. This seems a strange thing to be saying to the Greeks, who had come to see Him. He is telling them that there is more than just seeing him physically. The important thing for them to see, is that he is going to die. He is going to be put into the ground. When that grain of wheat died, it produced life. He died, but he rose again. That is so important to see. He goes on to explain a great axiom to the Greeks. There are two kinds of life, and they are put in contrast here. There is what is known as the psychological life, the life of the psyche, life that enjoys the things of this world and finds satisfaction in the gratification of the senses. It is the kind of life that really whoops it up down here. He that loveth his life, refers to this physical, natural life that we have. You can really live it up, drink it up, take drugs, paint the town red, but do you know what is going to happen? One day you are going to die. You'll lose it. I'm sorry, but you will lose it, friend. I heard of a sensational preacher down in Texas, who was asked to preach at the funeral of a rich man of the town, who had been a church member, but had broken every law of God and man, and was living in sin and in drunkenness. This was in the oil section of Texas, and a lot of rich people, the fast crowd, the jet set, came to the funeral. Now this preacher did something I wouldn't do, but maybe I should do it, although I never have done it. He preached a gospel message. Then he stepped down to the casket, 
and he preached on what sin will do for an individual, and that it will finally send a man to hell. I tell you, the folks were getting uneasy. Then when he invited them to view the remains, he said, his life is past, he lived it up, he is through. He despised God and he turned his back on Jesus Christ. Then he looked at that crowd and said, this is the way each one of you is going to end up, unless you turn to Jesus Christ. Now, friend, that is making it very plain, maybe a little too plain. We do need to tell it like it is. This is what our Lord says. He that loveth his life shall lose it. That is, if you live it up down here, you'll lose it. Then our Lord makes a contrast. He that hates his life in this world, shall keep it unto life eternal. This means that if you do not live for this world, or for the things of this world, you keep your life unto life eternal. And eternal life comes from what? It comes through the death of that grain of wheat, that fell into the ground and rose again, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the way you can save your life, the only way you can save it. If any man serve me let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be, if any man serve me, him will my father honor, John 12 26. He tells them to follow him, and he is on his way to the cross. He promises that where he is, his servants will also be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor.